Hello everybody, today is a big day. It is Palantir Q4 2022 earnings. This is a day that a lot of us have been looking forward to it for a while. The Super Bowl was yesterday. Today is the real Super Bowl for Palantir shareholders. In this video, I want to do a couple things. Number one, I want to talk about the quantitative metrics that I would like to see Palantir hit and how I feel about those quantitative metrics getting closer and closer to our goal, ultimately of being gap profitable. Second, I want to talk about the qualitative things I'm looking to see from this earnings calls and the thing that would make me feel a little bit more comfortable in my investment in Palantir over the next five years. And then finally, I want to go through some of the most common shareholder questions that were asked that got thousands of upvotes, why those questions I think really are missing the point of the investment thesis in Palantir. And I guess we'll see if Palantir is able to answer those questions. So let's get into it. The official Palantir earnings preview. We will be live streaming it today, 4.30 p.m. Eastern on my channel. So if you're watching this after the earnings call or if you're watching this before, 4.30 Eastern on my channel, type in Palantir Q4 2022 earnings live stream and you'll find it. Okay, quantitative metrics. Revenue, we're expecting about $504 million. Can we get to this revenue number? This would be a big deal if we cross about $503 million because that will get us to $1.9 billion of revenue for the full year. This was a company that did, you know, just did $1.5 billion. Before that, they were doing $1 billion. To get to $1.9 billion is not a bad trajectory of growth. Now, granted, we are going to talk about profit profitability and operating margins in a second, but if they can get to that $1.9 number, that would be nice. Much less somehow get to $2 billion, which I do not think is going to happen, but if they can get to at least $503, $504 million of revenue, that would be good. Can they beat on revenue? Yes, because Alice Carp is basically saying that Q4 has been good for Palantir from a commercial perspective uh, in the United States. He is all but literally said we're growing, you know, XYZ growth rate in Q4 because in all the interviews he's had, he hasn't been able to be that explicit, but he said we're growing like a weed in the United States because America is able to adapt. And he's echoed that message really for the past couple months now. So I would not be surprised to see a revenue beat simply based on Q4 United States commercial growth. Now, do I think that's going to happen given the the really crappy macro situation we're in and Palantir's Salesforce still not being developed to the point where, you know, they can really scale. No. So I would keep my expectations very low for beating on revenue. If we do beat maybe by a million, two million, something like that. If anything, I think the expectations are more so the street is expecting 504 million. We might actually come in lower at around 502, 503, maybe even 500, which would still be a great quarter to put a 500 million. It would just be below street expectations, which would send the stock down uh, just based on the algorithm. So I'm expecting at least 500 million. If we get there, that's awesome. If we beat 504, that'd be amazing. If we don't, if we get to at least 500, that'd be okay. EPS, the street is expecting three cents per share. Do we think we get there? Maybe. Uh, historically, Pounter has always missed on EPS, primarily because we have a lot of losses based on our SPAC investments. It seems like we offloaded a decent amount of those and we kind of cleared up the balance sheet from that respect. But do I think that there are some extenuating circumstances which may lead to a miss on EPS? Yes. So if we can get the three cents per share, that'd be awesome. If we don't get there, that would be expected, and that would also tank the stock, which, again, has historically happened many times when it comes to Palantir. Okay, so that's revenue, that's EPS. The next two numbers, or three numbers that I'm really looking for are the following. SBC, gap profitability, and international growth. So SBC, it's been declining almost 29% year over year. Every single quarter we see that year over year, if you look at this month, the, these three months versus those three months from last year, it's down 29%. I would like to see another reduction in around 30% of SBC. If we can get stock-based compensation going lower and lower, which is basically how much the company is using their stock to pay their employees, that will get us closer to gap profitability because that means they're not using the actual shares of the stock. They're not diluting us as shareholders to pay their employees. The logic for why they're doing this is obvious. They need the best talent in the world. They're competing with some of the biggest tech companies, but at some level, you know, you've got to stop diluting shareholders and you've got to turn the business profitable, which leads me into the next metric, gap profitability. We are about negative 9% in terms of gap profitability, generally accepted accounting principles. Operationally, if you take out stock-based compensation, we made $424 million of profit operationally, not gap profit in 2021. So you know, it, it, $424 million is a lot of money in, in profit and for, for a company that's, you know, relatively been public for almost two years now, but that SBC is weighing us down. If we get rid of that SBC, or at least it's coming down, if we can get gap profitability from negative 9% to maybe negative 7%, at least that shows me 2025 is the profitability target. Can we crack that in 2024 by getting gap profitability to come much sooner? That would be really good. Wall Street would like that, and it can get us onto a positive trajectory for not only growth, but profitable growth over the next five years. So I think getting to gap profitability is the biggest concern for Palantir. How quick can they get there? I don't know, but if they can at least show us they're trying to get there quicker than normal, quicker than 2025, that would be great for me. 
Final uh, number I'm looking for is international growth. Uh, Carp has said international growth is not good. I mean, he's been pretty honest about that. He said, look, commercial growth in European nations and governmental growth is okay, but commercial growth is just bad because those countries, in his words, are not willing to adapt to new software as easily as the United States. If that is the case, then we're probably not going to see you know, massive amounts of international growth, at least this quarter, or even for the next two quarters until Palantir figures that out from a sales perspective. So I am looking forward to seeing the numbers. I don't expect them to be good internationally, but if we can at least see that they're trying, they're forming different partnerships, they're doing different things here and there, then maybe that can get us closer over the next couple of quarters. U.S. commercial growth, I expect to beat it pretty significantly, given how CARP's been talking. Uh, international commercial, I don't expect to be that good. Okay, that's some of the quantitative stuff I care about. Qualitative stuff I care about. Last time, Pouncher did a Q4 earnings call for 2021. They did it in a really nice big setup. It was a nice room. They had really, you know, they, they had like backlit lights and stuff. Like it was a really good production. I don't think we're going to get that this time. If we do, that would be nice. If we can get a little bit of a cart monologue, that'd be nice. I know people don't like the cart monologue. I actually like listening to the cart monologues because it gives me an understanding of what my CEO, my founder CEO is actually thinking about the company. So I would like a nice production. If we don't get a nice production, it's whatever. We'll still be listening it pretty intently. Um, from a real qualitative perspective, I want to know a couple things. Number one, I want to know if governmental deals are starting to materialize in a meaningful way in terms of winning contract value. So I think Palantir has about $3.6 billion of government contracts that they have yet to actually accrue, meaning they have the ability to win those deals, but they're not accruing them. I want a little bit of an update on when that is going to happen. Are they getting closer to seeing some of those deals happen? Are they getting even more demand from international government? Because we've seen a lot of the United States uh, governmental deals happen over the past couple of months. Can we get more international governmental deals? And can that can those deals actually materialize within the next couple of years or are these like 10 year contracts before we get these billions of dollars? So I would really like to see like, where is the government growth coming from? Is there more demand internationally for governmental growth? And how is that going to affect the business? Second thing I would like to see is the impact of the Russia-Ukraine war. CARP and company have been talking, you know, profoundly about how this war has helped their company in terms of just getting their name out there, not because the war is good, but because their software is actually able to stop bad things that are happening within the war and be like really mission critical. Skykit, that was one of the wartime products, is a hardware product that they just introduced. I want to know how has that Russia-Ukraine situation actually affected the business? We've heard from a marketing side, it's been really good for Palantir. I want to know, well, has it resulted in numbers? And if it hasn't, that's okay, because I don't expect them to get billions of dollars from Ukraine, especially in this time of crisis. But I do want to know, have they seen other countries call them up and say, hey, you're doing for Ukraine this really cool thing. Can we have a sales conversation? Because maybe you can do for us what you're doing for Ukraine so that we don't have to worry about someone invading us. So I would like to get a little bit more of a qualitative metric understanding what the impact of that war has been. Finally, I would like to know where do they think the world is going in terms of danger. Now, why am I bringing this up? There have been quite a few UFO sightings over the past couple of days. If you've not been living under a rock, you've been seeing that things are a little weird. We've seen China, spy balloons, all this random crazy stuff happening. I actually wouldn't mind Carp speaking about this. Remember in Q2 2022, when uh, we were at the height of the Russia-Ukraine kind of like media coverage, uh, nuclear war was a really big deal. And a lot of people were talking about, could this potentially happen? So Carp started the earnings call with eight minutes of a monologue about why he thinks nuclear war is closer than it's ever been and why a product like Palantir could potentially solve that issue or at least mitigate the effects of what would happen if there was some type of massive, you know, crazy war. And that's timely stuff because it matters in the context of being a Palantir investor because you know that's why you're investing. You're investing in them to be able to solve these things. The Turkey earthquake that just happened, we're seeing that Palantir, we saw, I made a video about it, that there's like a link that leads to a, um, deprem.palantirfoundry.com link, which is means uh, means earthquake deprem. And it's leading back to some of the stuff that's going on in Turkey. Can we get an update on, are you guys actually working there? How quick were you immediately to respond? Sham Sankar immediately responded on Twitter when this earthquake was happening, telling Turkish officials to DM him and saying that they could really help solve these issues. I want to know, given the crazy UFOs that are happening, given potentially China being more aggressive to Taiwan, given some of the concerns around national security when it comes to applications like TikTok and China spy balloons, what is Palantir's role and how do they think of the next year or the next couple of years in terms of solving those issues? I know they've spoken about this more vaguely. Generally, I would like to get some concrete kind of business fundamentals of like, hey, this stuff is happening and we could play a direct role in stopping these things. And we think the world is going to get even more crazier and messier. Therefore, we think this could have a, you know, a, a, a positive effect on our business because we would be able to step up. I have made the argument that if aliens do come, the only company I think that's going to solve that issue is not Snowflake, is not Databrace. These are great companies. I think it's going to be Palantir. If we have an alien invasion, I think it's going to be Palantir. So I would like to get a little bit more of a qualitative analysis on where they see the world going, especially given all the current events and what they think might happen as a result of that. All right. Uh, now I want to quickly just review some of these shareholder, um, I guess, questions that we've gotten. 
Top three questions on the shareholder uh, say.com integration with Robinhood is Abraham T says, when is Palantir going to become profitable? Timothy says, how is this company not profitable given the amount of governmental contracts? Justin L says, what will it take for Palantir to finally return a profit to its long-term investors? So a lot of these questions were okay. You know, some of these were about ChatGPT, AI, et cetera. Some of them, this one actually about Snowflake. Snowflake is capturing developers' mind share by providing a marketplace for building data apps. How do you compete with this to become the AWS of this decade? That's a great question in my opinion. But at least the first three questions, as we can see by retail, that was upvoted was primarily rooted in this concept of profitability. So I just wanted to spend the next couple of minutes talking about this concern. It's a legit concern. It matters. As I talked about in the beginning, if they can become gap profitable, the market will respect them more. Their employees will actually be able to gain something from their shares because their shares will have value if the company becomes profitable because the shares will go up and they will appreciate. And so that stock-based compensation will actually mean something. So profitability will help everyone. It'll definitely help shareholders. But I think it's the wrong question to ask right now. We know why they're not profitable right now. We know stock-based compensation is a concern. We know their sales force is not that big. We know they are trying, they're having troubles expanding internationally. All of these things have to be resolved before we really get a sense of, of true profitability. SoFi, another stock that I'm into heavily, uh, said that they might get to be profitable by 2023. They've been public for, you know, since 2021. So it, it took them a good two years and by the end of 2023. So you could almost imagine three years of them becoming profitable, but the progress they have made as a company and I know, you know, the stock price is down massively, but 2021, it was just kind of crazy. And obviously things have become back to normal. The, the progress they have made, the acquisitions they have made, the ability for them to create the fundamentals for their business to have a real long-term, as my cowbell falls down, uh, potential for success um, it, it is massive, right? And I think that's the same thing that Palantir is doing. If they can get profitable within the next year, within the next year and a half, but build up the fundamentals. So like the AWS of this decade, the ontology sort of as a service of this decade, those are the questions I think retail should care about, especially if you actually understand the company. If you're just saying, hey, the company's not profitable, share dilution, blah, 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 you probably shouldn't be investing, right? Because you don't get the thesis, you don't understand it. And same thing with Tesla. I'm not saying Palantir is Tesla. I'm just saying there were many years where there were all these concerns until Tesla finally started showing the results, but those results only accumulated in terms of shareholder appreciation if you were with the company knowing that they would get there and betting that they would get there, having a, a strong hypothetical calculation that they would get there versus jumping in at a trillion dollar market cap. And so this is just the nature of investing. Profitability to me is not the biggest concern. What is the biggest concern is, are they really building a technological product, an AWS of this decade for developers, a product that can be used in wartime situations and mission critical situations when there's an earthquake and that there is no other alternative other than them? Because if that's the case, and if they figure out sales, and if they keep building out their infrastructure over the next five, six years, Palantir will become profitable and they will be growing profitably at a meaningful rate. The question is, are they the company we think they can become? And that's what I think these early years of earnings calls are for. They're not for these you know, generic questions about profitability and, and the balance sheet, because that stuff will work itself, work itself out if the tech and if the company is actually moving towards the right direction. So those are my thoughts on earnings. Thank you all so much for listening to your thoughts. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Earnings today, 4.30 p.m. I'll be live. I hope to see you there. And uh, we will see what is the future of Palantir. Thanks so much for listening and watching. I'll see you on the next one.